and welcome to Code with Star. How are you doing today? Today we're going to talk about the return type for the Web API. For those new to the channel, this is a part of the Fishcard series. Fishcard is a website that allows you to query fishes, and it will tell you whether the fish is healthy to eat or not. We start from the front end, talk about how to build it by Blazor. Then we move on to the back end, the Web API. And we have talked about the RESTful API architectural principles. We covered the HTTP verbs and the routing. And today we're going to talk about the response portion, uh, specifically the return type. In C Sharp, the return type is relatively easy. We have void, which doesn't return anything. We have a specific class, or in case of an asynchronous, you return task of T. For a web API, a result is a little bit more than that. There are body, status code, and headers. For example, if we query a specific fish item by its ID, you're going to get a response with a status code of 200 OK, a fish item in form of JSON returned by the body. And if we pay attention, there are some headers. Let's see another example. If we create a fish item, you got a status code 201 created, the body for created item, and some headers. Well, pay attention to the location header. If you watched the last video, you'll know we did something to make it happen. And we're going to understand why it's there. Before that, let's check the code of get a fish item first. Now, the return type for the method is a specific class, fish item. That class defines the body but there's no control over the status code or the headers whatsoever. The status code is based on the convention that when the method succeeded, it's going to be 200. That's a simple implementation. What's the problem? Well, you don't have control over the status code, but still, why is that a problem? Hmm, let's say for an API, if a URL points to something that doesn't exist, which written code should be used? 204, no content, or 404, not found? That's actually a tricky question. Could be either. It really depends on how you design your system, how the client works, a lot of things to consider. The point is, though, sometimes you need 404, sometimes you need 204. Let's see what the web API will do by default. I'll change a character in the grid. So it's pretty much not going to hit any existing fish item. And the result is uh, 204, no content. OK, so the question is, what if? What if I want 404 in that situation? We could take over just everything like this. Firstly, we check if a fish item is now or not. And if it is now, we're going to manually set the status code to not found. And since we are manually manipulating the HTTP context, we're not going to return anything. Instead, when the fish item is not null, we're going to directly write the fish item as JSON into the response. Now let's try that again. 404. As you can see, technically, it is not difficult to manipulate any part of the response because everything's here on the response object. And you can get it by accessing this HTTP context object. And that is on the base class. However, that is a lot of details to deal with. If you read the code, all of a sudden, your mindset needs to switch from dealing with the fish item to the status code and the headers, so on and so forth. Compared to the original code, it becomes tedious. And uh, one slip of the mind, we're going to make some funny error. For example, a mismatched status code and the result. Here, let me show you what I mean. It could be a status code of 500, internal server error, plus some random object. Let's see what will happen in such case. Let me query the fishes in the copy the ID.
And when we get the fish item, voila! 500 internal server error with a random property random value object. It's a funny result, right? The problem is, since there's no compiler error, we're not going to catch it until it's runtime. Well, this is just an example. You're not going to make mistakes as ridiculous as this one. What I'm saying is, it is very easy to make a mistake. So what can we do? Let's get back to the original code and uh, check what the problem is. Firstly, we still want to branch out the code so that we can have different responses for when it is null versus it's not null. When the fish item is null, we want it to return something and it will set the status code to 404. There's actually a class called not found without and we can return it like this. And otherwise we return fish item. This is what we want, except that the return type becomes either not found readout or fish item. We can have only one type for return in C sharp. It doesn't look like the type of not found readout can be changed to fish item. However, it is relatively easy to wrap fish item into something else. And that something else is I action readout. Here, both not found readout and OK object readout implements the interface of I action readout. When ASP.NET Core sees the result of I action readout, it will manipulate the HTTP context for us. For example, if it is not found readout, it will write the status code to 404. And if it is an OK object readout, it then sets the status code to 200 and serializes the fish item into JSON. Pay attention to the difference. For OK object result, it was two statements. The mismatch happened there. It becomes one atom line of code. And that is the core idea of the written type. We pick one and let ASP.NET Core to handle the details. If we break down the class name, not found is 404, OK is 200. When there's an object in front of readout, it will take an object, make it the body of the response. And this is how it looks like when it's running. When there's a hit of the fish item, this is a OK object readout. And when the fish item is no, it is not found readout. Coming back to the code, I think this is cleaner than it was before. And we could make it even more clean. Thanks to the methods belongs to the controller base class. And you can see this is a not found provided by the controller base. And then we have OK. Those methods create the object for us so that we don't need to call the constructors ourselves. Well, if you are interested, check out the source code. There's a really not too much there. That was fun. Web API provides some other methods to put up even more constraints. Those are like uh, guardrails to help you reduce mistakes, especially for those runtime errors. For example, you could define how many status code could be returned by a specific method and what's the type of the object. Let's take a look at an example. Without the constraint, I could almost return anything instead of a fish item. I'm going to return a string, for example. It still compiles and it still works. But pay attention to the body. Now it is a string. The problem is uh, your client, like JavaScript, it would expect a JSON object while it is getting a string. That is when produces the response type attribute becomes useful. Let's see how to apply that. Here is the attribute. It has three overloads. They will put constraints on status code only, or the type plus status code, or type plus status code plus content type. Let's say this method is going to return a fish item with the status code 200. If we build it like this, there's going to be nothing. The warning on the screen is irrelevant. What we'll need to do is to turn on the analyzer. And here's how to do it. 
we go to the project file in property group, add a property called include the open API analyzers and the value to be true. Let's uh, build it again. This time we see two warnings. And the second one says, action method returned on declared status code 404. Yep, that's right. There's a chance for us to return 404. So we're going to add it to the produce the response type attribute list. And let's build it again. The warning is gone. That is useful to remind us not to return anything unexpected, especially for the status code. But it has a small flaw that it doesn't constrain the type of the object that is wrapped inside the object result. In our case, hello random string is a string. It's not a fish item. But at the same time, there's no compile error. Here we need something else called action result t. You could imagine it as a strong type to action result. And here's how you use it. Now, if you pay attention, there's still no squiggles on the hello random string. But what you could do is to return fish item directly. Comparing to I action result, action result of t knows how to do the conversion from fish item to action result of fish item. So if we use it correctly, fish item is allowed, string or any other type is not allowed to be returned. See, there's the compiler error when I try to return the string. The side effect of using action result of t is that the type is already baked in and we don't need it any further on the produce the response type attribute. Just to mention it, if we put a swagger generator on top of that, the schema of the fish item will be recognized. All right, that is uh, an example of using result object to control the status code. How about the headers? Let's take a look at another example. Remember, our goal is to manipulate the three parts of a response, the status code, the body, and the header. When we create a new fish item, we want the status code to be 201 created, the body to be the newly created item. Now pay attention to the ID. Because in the header, we want the location to pointing to the newly created item. And that will be located by the ID. The idea for the implementation is very similar. It is yet another result type. The type that we picked here is create at action result. When it is create at action, the status code will be 201, created, either PD. And the body of the response is provided by the third parameter. That's also easy. Now the first two parameters are there to forming up the location header. The first one is the name of an action. In our example, it is get that returns the fish item. Get takes in the parameter of the fish ID. We want it to be the ID of the new fish item. And we happen to have it on this new item object. And that's our route value. Those were two examples to manipulate the response, including, again, the status code, the body, and the headers. And of course, there are more return types. If we want to figure out what else are there, press F12 on the method. There's a lot of information in the comments on this controller base class. Another good spot is the official documentation. This basically covers all those commonly used results. Once you get yourself familiar with it, it is very easy to pick the status code and the headers that you want to use without worrying about mismatches. That's for the controller-based API. Um, what about minimal API? Now, I assume you have a level of understanding what a minimal API is. If you say, don't know, don't care, that's fine. Feel free to skip ahead to the next chapter. Okay, for an action in minimal API, it doesn't inherit from controller base. Will it work if we reuse OK object result or something like that? Let's find out together. Again, the idea is to align the return type. So let's try OK object result. 
If we could use that, we could use not found, we could use no content, we could use everything else. There's no compile error. Based on what we learned, we are expecting a response with status code 200 and the body of a string. Let me run it. The result is a straight serialization of the OK object result. Apparently, minimal API doesn't understand OK object result. So what can we do? Well, there's the result class in minimal API. Here's how to use it. Results.ok and then the object for the body. Refresh the result in the browser. Let's take a deep look at this results class. It is a static class under the namespace of Microsoft ASP.NET Core HTTP. OK, it's a method on it. As you guessed, there are other methods like not found, no content, etc. etc. Let's try to use not found. You'll see how similar it is compared to the action result. Well, not only it is similar, it could be directly used there so that you could reuse the implementations for the actions. Let's update the code of the controller based API again. From action result of t to i result. And here we're going to use the results dot not found. And results dot ok. Well, not found, let's create one. This is when it is there. Cool, but the type validation is gone again. And of course, there's uh, typed results. I'll show you what I mean. Let's say you might return not found or you might return OK fish item. And the results is in a slightly different class called typed results. Now the type validation is back. For example, if I change the return type, the possible return type to no content, there will be a compile error. Let's see it in action again. Found. Not found. All right, let's get back to the original question. How do we pick a return type? I think you already have the answer. Here are just my two cents. Basically, we use different return types to control various aspects for the responses, including the status code, the body, and the headers. Use a specific types if the API is very simple. When it is complex, for controller-based web API, use the action of T. And for minimal API, use the results of T1, T2, Tn. And for large projects, especially for those uh, generate swagger spec, use produces the response type attribute and turn on open API analyzers. If there's an edge case, all those return types just could not fulfill the needs. Then we fall back to manipulate HTTP context.response directly. Cool, that's all I have at this moment. Now I hope you enjoyed the content. Please give me a thumb up if you reached this point of the video. Keep coding, keep improving, and I'll see you in the next one. Until then, take care.